what's well, a minute or so past the hour of uh, 8 o'clock East Coast time and 5 o'clock Pacific time. So let me start the webinar. Let me begin by um, welcoming everybody. Before I go too much further, I just want to do a sound check. Uh, Nathan, are you able to hear me okay? I hear you great. Okay, thank you. Well, everybody, my name is Jaggy Gill. I'm the uh, founder of 10X Health, and it's my privilege to uh, welcome our speaker today, Dr. Jay Sandu. I also want to begin by thanking all of you. I know it's late in the day for many of you to uh, take the time out um, and to, to uh, appreciate this uh, presentation that uh, Dr. Sandu is going to provide. Uh, a couple of logistic things before I introduce Dr. Sandu. Uh, everyone is on mute right now, and when I finish, Dr. Sandu will give his presentation. He will present uninterrupted, and what I would request is that if you have any questions, uh, please type them in as you've logged on to the GoToMeeting on one of your screens, you should have the opportunity to type in a question. We'll be able to receive that on our side. And then um, at the end of the meeting, uh, I'll obviously go through those questions and pose them to Dr. Sandu. At the very end of the meeting, we will open up the mics. Uh, that always can be a bit hairy and noisy, so we want to reserve that at the end. So if anyone has any specific questions for Dr. Sandu, they'll be able to uh, put them to him uh, at the end of the meeting. But at any time, type in your questions, and we'll be able to tabulate them and put, put them to him at the end. So with that, let me uh, begin by introducing uh, Dr. Sandu. Uh, I've known him for uh, the recent past. He is um, a very effective speaker. Dr. Sandu is a podiatric surgeon in Dallas, Texas, practicing at Irving Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. He also is a, um, an educator, and he takes part of a podiatric residency program in, in Texas as well. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to him, and hopefully everyone can see his screen. And uh, Jay, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Juggy. Uh, good evening, everyone, from uh, sunny Dallas, Texas. It's uh, just after 7 o'clock and still 91 degrees, so I'm happy to be inside and cool air conditioning and speak with you fine folks today about 10X. It's a revolutionary technology that I'd like to share my experiences with, and then some tips and uh things I've learned along the way that made my life easier with 10X. And then, of course, as Juggy mentioned, uh, we'll, we'll definitely kick it off for some question and answers and discussion. This is always the most beneficial and educational part. So uh, as Juggy mentioned, I practice in an orthopedic group just outside of Dallas, uh, closer to Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. We uh, primarily are musculoskeletally focused. I, was, uh, I had the privilege of being a fellowship-trained podiatrist, one of the many uh, that are out there right now but the few at the time that I was training. So I like to focus on trauma and sports medicine type cases. I do a minimal amount of diabetic wound care, nerve release type cases. I see a wide variety of ages. Um, something about being 90 in Texas is kind of like 73 in Ohio. Not really sure what it is, but it's probably linked to the sunshine. And then in terms of payer mix, we see pretty much what everybody else does, a split between Medicare and private, but we do see a fair amount of workman's compensation injuries as well. So what is 10X? I think our discussion should start with a little bit of introductory information. I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with it, but just for the sake of completeness, we should touch on this. Uh, this is a percutaneous, minimally invasive treatment option that's relatively new, and is designed to accurately and specifically remove soft tissue slash tendon pathology under direct visualization with an ultrasound. The instrumentation is twofold. One is a console that we'll be discussing later, the instrument that actually does the removal of the tissue is what you can see in the picture here. Through there's, there's a lot of scientific explanation, which is above my pay grade to explain, but essentially you're using ultrasonic jackhammering effect to cut and remove, cut and remove, all that inflammatory disease tendon. Uh, at the same time, we're at this process of cleaning out, you have a continuous saline irrigation, which not only cools the micro tip, but prevents thermal necrosis of the, the tissue. The main thing to know about this slide is that the 10x microtip only removes diseased tissue. Healthy tissue is never touched and never removed or never harmed. So the setup is pretty much what you see in the top left corner. You have a physician with the patient draped in a minimally fashion based on the area that's being cleaned out and treated. There's an ultrasound machine set up as well. The illustration to the bottom kind of gives you a more detailed version. You have a transducer in one hand and the micro tip I mentioned in the other hand. And it's an easy three-step process. You visualize the damaged tendon, which is the dark region on the ultrasound. 
you introduce the micro tip after making a stab incision with an 11 blade, which is provided in the kit. And then utilizing direct visualization of the ultrasound and a foot pedal, you activate the micro tip to cut and remove the uh, targeted damaged tissue. There's two main applications in the lower extremity, that being plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendinosis or fasciosis. The orange strip to the left marks the placement of the ultrasound transducer. This can be done in a short or long axis, which I'll touch on as well. From an ultrasound standpoint, we always have to discuss this uh, because this is very important and vital to the 10X procedure. The top picture on the right shows you what the quote-unquote normal picture looks like for a fas plantar fascia. You see the outline of the calcaneus and the inferior aspect of the foot and the uh, plantar fascia as it attaches from there. Notice the nice hyperechoic changes. There's no abnormal contouring or disease tendon present. The opposite holds true when we look at a pathological patient with plantar fascia, or plantar fasciitis or plantar fasciosis. In addition to the thickening and abnormal contouring of the plantar fascia, we see a high amount of damaged or hypoechoic tissues. And this is what we're trying to target with the 10X device and ultimately trying to get pain relief for our patients. This is a basic setup. In this situation, the patient is in a prone position, but uh, I'll mention later there's various positions that can be used to perform this procedure. The debridement instrumentation is introduced from a medial to lateral fashion. There is some variance on this as well. The ultrasound transducer is held in the left picture uh, along the longitudinal axis of the foot or parallel to the plantar fascia, or conversely, it can be used parallel to the micro tip in a short axis fashion. In the Achilles tendon, the patient is almost always prone unless there's a BMI reason or a medical reason why they aren't able to be prone. And the transducer position is very similar to what we just saw. Uh, position A shows that the transducer can be held parallel to the Achilles tendon versus B is transverse to it. And then again, going back to healthy versus diseased, the top right picture shows us what a normal Achilles tendon looks like. We see the Achilles tendon attaching to that middle one-third of the posterior aspect of the calcaneus. We see that nice striation, no abnormal contouring, no calcific deposits, no spurring to the posterior aspect of the calcaneus. The opposite is true in the diseased portion of the tendon in the uh, picture below, where you can see that pinpoint blackened area of hypoechoic damaged tissue. And again, this is what we're after when we introduce the micro tip into the, during the procedure. So what made me interested in 10X? This is a question I get from a lot of people who I start talking about this uh, procedure with. As a young physician, I'm constantly seeking out new alternative treatment options. I try to attend as many lectures as I can, conferences. I'm constantly reading journals, looking at the front and the backs of journals for new inventions, new devices, just trying to keep up with everything that's new and coming out. I work in a medically dense area. There's quite a bit of podiatrists where I work, uh, also foot and ankle surgeons, both MDs and DOs. So I find myself trying to figure out how to way I can make myself stand out from them. And I'm always looking for new ways to treat old issues. This isn't out of disrespect for the old treatment options. You know, I'm not looking to replace a, an old treatment, but rather add a new treatment option to my tool belt. So uh, about a year or two ago, I came across something called 10X. This was introduced to me by a group of hand surgeons who specialized in minimally invasive carpal tunnel surgery. I had a chance to meet with the rep, who I'm still working with today. He brought in the ultrasound, a, the 10X console, and the micro tip that we just saw. And maybe it was a Texas thing, but he brought in a stake as well for us to practice on. And it, was, it turned out to be pretty accurate in hindsight. I was able to do everything he said, and I performed the procedure as he described. So as I go along, I always try to analyze things. My first impression was this was a pretty fast, easy operation procedure to perform. From a, when I spoke to Ron, my rep, he told me about the minimal downtime that was available for the post-operative recovery. This also piqued my interest. The technology of the ultrasound and removing the, the pathological tissue only while the healthy tissue remains intact was very sound to me. I did like that. And overall, it was just a very effective and efficient process that's something that would help a number of my patients. Is there a learning curve to this? Absolutely. There's a learning curve to anything new that you do. In this case, it's twofold. The learning curve for the 10X machine is very, very small. I mean, using an iPhone and an iPad or it is much harder than actually using the 10X console. 
So with that being said, it's a very easy system to use both for the physician and or any supporting staff you may have in the operating room in your surgery centers and hospitals. Everything you need comes in the kit. Your reps will bring a kit the day of the procedure. The kit contains the uh, micro tip, which is uh, disposable, an 11 blade team for you to make your incision, covers for your ultrasound units, ultrasound jelly, and post-operative bandaging. There's even templates for dictation purposes, as well as a post-operative instruction sheet. So it's really, really convenient to have all of this. You don't have to call for special instrumentation for uh, your hospital. It makes it, the, the company makes it very, very easy to perform and set up and plan for. Ultrasound. This is something that I'm going to touch on a few times. I've had a chance to work with the ultrasound uh, on the foot and ankle on and off since residency. So it's not an entirely foreign concept to me, but it, this takes the longest time to get used to. Uh, we, uh, like any other imaging modality, we first must challenge ourselves and take it upon ourselves to learn what normal tissue looks like. Only then are we able to identify pathological and disease changes. Not only that, but I challenge you to use a, a good quality ultrasound. Think about an old television from the 70s and 80s versus the ultra HD 4K televisions we have today. Since the entire procedure is performed under direct visualization of disease tending, a low quality ultrasound will not make your experience uh, very, very productive at all. So I really encourage you to not only get used to an ultrasound, but to try to find the highest quality available ultrasound you can. Who needs 10X? Another great question that a lot of people ask. It's meant for people that have chronic pain, meaning somebody's had this pain for three to four months. It's meant for those that have pain with pinpoint palpation and those that you can see the pathological changes on the ultrasound, like we did in the Achilles tendon in the previous slide, like we did in the plantar fasciitis in the previous slide. It's meant for those who've tried and failed treatment options before, night splints, braces, custom orthotics, cortisone injections, PRP injections, shock waves, and any other number of products that may be purchased from Sky Mall magazines. There's a lot of people out there that want surgery, but they don't want the downtime. This is a challenging condition for patients uh, and physicians. We definitely have treatment options such as endoscopic plantar fasciotomies or uh, the instep plantar fasciotomy, both of which I've done and I'm happy with, but there is a downtime associated with that because we're operating plantarly. So having something that has a, a, having a procedure that is very, very minimally invasive that in turn will require a minimal amount of downtime is wonderful for patients such as athletes and workman's comp patients. Yes, believe it or not, there are actually workman's comp patients that want to go back to work. Who is it not meant for? Again, a person who just had this heel pain or Achilles tendinosis pain two weeks ago. The chronic pain patient is another one to kind of be cognizant of, the one that tells you that they've tried everything and nothing helps. In these situations, uh, I was told a long time ago to be careful who I operate on. I mean, I always listen to those words when I hear a patient tell me that nothing has happened, nothing has helped despite their full treatments. So urge, I urge you to use some caution on that. Obviously, an infection is a contraindication to this as well. Specifically to the plantar fascia and the Achilles, this procedure is not intended to remove any bone spurs. Um, I get very upset when somebody tells me that they have a bone spur that's causing their first step pain in the morning when they wake up. I never ever say the S word when I tell somebody about their heel pain origins. I feel like if you do, you're planting a seed in their head and no matter how much better they get, they'll always be hesitant to tell you they're 100% because their spur is the problem. So as long as you make it clear to them that you won't be removing or touching any bony problems, that this is a soft tissue problem only, it'll be a clear expectation. At the same time, with the Achilles tendon, should a patient present with a Haglund's triad, meaning they have insertional Achilles tendinosis, a retrocalcaneal exostosis, and a retrocalcaneal bursitis, the conversation again needs to be had preoperatively that the 10X procedure for now only deals with the Achilles tendinosis pain. It will not remove the pump pump in any means. What's my postoperative protocol? This is something I've been kind of toying around with over the last several months, uh, but I think I've got it down to the point where it's very, very functional and, and I've had a high rate of success. In both situations, I allow full weight bearings tolerated in either a short or a tall cam boot. In some cases, I will augment the cam boot with a heel cup in the plantar fascist case. 
and a heel lift in the Achilles tendinosis case, just for added support. Uh, these boots can be removed when they drive, bathe, and sleep. There is just a waterproof dressing, a little bit of Tegaderm and a Band-Aid that goes on afterwards, so these patients don't have to use any fancy grocery bags or $20 waterproof cast bags to keep their foot and ankle dry in the shower. In terms of post-operative pain relief, I don't like to use a lot of strong anti-inflammatory medications. I do not want to inhibit that post-operative inflammatory response and prevent the recruitment of growth factors that in turn will cause healing. So I just recommend over-the-counter over Tylenol for a few days. I've started to see these patients consistently one week post-operatively. As far as I can remember, aside from one or two patients, nobody has come back to my office in the boot. Everybody feels comfortable taking the boot off usually three to four days after surgery. And then, the, as recommended, I do not allow any high-impact activities until about week six. Uh, they are permitted low-impact activities, such as biking and swimming, immediately after the skin and stab incision is healed. But I would refrain to allowing high-impact activities just because I don't want to be the first person that reports a tendon sprain, strain or rupture from having the 10X procedure. I mentioned earlier that everything you need comes in the kit. This is a copy of the patient instruction that's provided in the uh, 10X kit. This is something that I give my patients postoperatively. You can see in the top left corner that there are specific instructions uh, to the 10X procedure regarding driving, application of ice, very similar to the postoperative instructions that we all give to our patients. Specifically to the Achilles and plantar fascia is another section in the bottom right. You can see with the Achilles that daily general non-weight-bearing range of motion exercises are encouraged early on, uh, and stretches are encouraged at three weeks. Uh, the last bullet point is the same for both of them, which mentions that if the patient is asymptomatic after a period of six weeks, they may resume activities as tolerated subject to our approval. So my criteria and guidelines are right in line with what the company recommends. What's my current experience with this? I've been doing this procedure since uh, early 2014. Uh, I've had a variety of patients. The, the, most of my patients are you know, within the, the 42 to 73 year old range. Not a lot of skinny folks, uh, but I've also had a large individual. The 400 pound gentleman was actually a retired police officer with terrible Achilles tendinosis. For the most part, these are patients that are falling within that 213 range. And these patients have had chronic situations of pain. I've had ranges of anywhere up to 36, but the mean pain duration time is usually about 11 months. In terms of case distribution, the majority of my cases have been plantar fascia cases. I have done Achilles tendinosis as well. However, this is only a fraction of my cases, and these are insertional only. I have yet to do a non-insertional Achilles tendinosis. In terms of how long do you do the actual procedure, my cutting time usually goes to about two and a half minutes. This is an anecdotal time. There's nothing on the machine or from the rep standpoint that cuts me off. I just feel as though after two and a half minutes, I've been able to clean out that hypoechoic tissue and remove a sufficient amount of diseased tissue. So for my pain management uh, measurement, I've used the AOFAS ankle hind foot scale. Right before surgery, I have my patients tell me what their pre-op pain levels are, which is just about 50. And then at that first week post-op, I have them retake the survey, and you can see my average increase is about 49 points, so I'm pretty happy with that. Have I had failures? Yes, and as my definition of a failure is a reoccurrence of my preoperative symptoms. I've had two of these so far. Both of them have been plantar fasciitis. So what does this all mean? In general, I think the plantar fascial patients are very, very happy. You've heard these statistics before from local reps and some literature that's out there. And it is true, in my opinion as well. The majority of these patients are almost 100% better in a short period of time. They will relate to some soft tissue edema right at the debridement site, but this is transient, will go away. In terms of the Achilles tendon, and again, I'm referring to only insertional, I usually can get them at least 50% better in a week, sometimes less, sometimes more. And when I ask myself why during the analysis, I think the answer lies in the anatomy. The lack of a synovial sheath, the tight soft tissue envelope, the lack of a significant amount of subcutaneous fat, I don't believe it allows for a lot of swelling. And this, I believe, in turn causes a lot of pain residually. Plus, a lot of these patients that have insertional Achilles tendinosis have had this for quite some time. 
So one 10x solution, since uh, one 10x treatment may relieve significant amount of pain, but the pathology might be so severe that a repeat procedure might be necessary. What does the recent literature tell us? This was a study out of Ortho, Indiana by Dr. Patel. They had a 12 patients, uh, which they followed up for 12 months. Each one of these plantar fascial patients had a single treatment and no additional intervention. Without any complications, Dr. Patel was able to achieve 92% of his patients to become pain-free at three months, and he was able to sustain this pain-free levels up to a year out. This was a larger study that I believe was recently published of 100 patients who underwent uh, plantar fascia treatment. They also had a single treatment, no intervention, also a 12-month follow-up, also no complications, and they were able to achieve 91% of their patients to become pain-free both at the six-month mark and they were able to sustain this a year out. So similar to what you've heard, similar to what I've presented, and similar to what the literature is telling us. There are a number of studies in published, uh, being published currently and in review right now, so we should see a, a huge number of articles in the future. What about the Achilles tendon? This is a study of 26 patients that averaged uh, symptomatic pain for 18 months. They again had a single treatment of 10x with no additional intervention. They did include the mean cutting time of 4 minutes and 24 seconds, which I did appreciate, and we'll touch on this later. And these patients were followed up at various times during the post-operative period. Without any complications, these folks were able to get 88% of their patients to have pain relief in one month, and they were able to sustain this at 16 months. So great results all around. Has, have I ever done a repeat procedure? Another question I get quite a bit. Not today. Uh, my criteria would be if a patient has continued pain at least three months out post-operatively, I don't see any need or indication to do uh, anything repeat-wise prior to this. I would consider and suggest getting an MRI to, prior to getting uh, the patient back in for a second 10x, just to make sure there's nothing else going on and your diagnosis is accurate. I was just speaking with Juggy prior to the webinar. I think I might be doing my first uh, repeat procedure. I have a, a woman who's had the 10x on her plantar fascia about 10 months ago, and she's still getting a little bit of pain. So she might be my first repeat procedure. Have I learned any tips and tricks along the way? Absolutely. Let's start off with marketing. You definitely want to take advantage of all your available resources. At our office, we're lucky enough to have uh, an office manager and a dedicated marketer who travel out to primary care physicians, local emergency rooms, urgent cares, pediatricians, physical therapist's office, etc., to not only say hello and introduce themselves, but just update them on what's new with our practice, what new treatment offerings are we offering? So we've definitely done this. Uh, the, the 10X reps are wonderful in providing literature and brochures, and we've taken these to our referral sources. You always have to advertise yourself in a way that somebody can remember you. We're all very busy. We know that when a rep comes in at lunchtime, they have about 30 seconds of our attention. So I try to take advantage of that time and give them something that they can remember. I would start off by saying, Hello, thank you for sending me Mr. So-and-so. I hope they were happy with the treatment they got. By the way, I wanted to give you this brochure about something called 10X. It's a minimally invasive way that I can treat patients with plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendinosis with no incisions, no stitches, and very little downtime. Just that sentence enough plants enough interest in that primary care physician's mind to send me enough patients. At the same time, you have a wealth of resources available from your 10X team not only at the local level, but at the national level. There's a wide variety of resources the marketing team has to establish your reputation in the local and state communities as a physician who performs the 10X procedure, which can help will bring more patients into your office. And then, as we know, patient referrals travel a long way. You might be able to do Mrs. Smith's plantar fasciitis. She may come back for the next foot. Her neighbor may come back for the Achilles. Her mailman's nephew may come back for the Achilles as well. From the procedure standpoint itself, and going back to the ultrasound point, you must become comfortable and you must train yourself with the ultrasound. Get a sense of what normal looks like, get a sense of what the pathological looks like. And then again, uh, the best advice I can give you is to perform your first procedure. We're all apprehensive and hesitant to perform something that we may not have heard of, that maybe somebody else in the community isn't doing, but take that first step. Take that first procedure uh, under your belt and you'll really get a sense of how beneficial this technology and procedure can be. 
When you perform the actual procedure, the anesthesia can be any number of things. It can be a straight local injection in the plantar fascia or the Achilles. You can do a full general anesthesia when you're doing some other procedure or something in between. At times, we've done popliteal blocks for some patients because they've actually requested it. And I should note that I always ask my patients what the pain relief is after a sufficient time of the popliteal block has worn off. From a patient positioning standpoint, whatever you're comfortable with works. The majority of our cases are in the supine position. You can do this lateral. You can do this prone. Sometimes it's uh, determined by a patient's comfort or health or airway. Sometimes it's determined by the surgeon's preference or what other surgical procedures need to be done. And then again, get the highest quality ultrasound you can. The anesthesiologists usually have an ultrasound machine in the OR if they're doing blocks, but a lot of this is not musculoskeletal ultrasound. They're more vascular related. So again, you don't want to give yourself a, a bad ultrasound, which will inhibit your ability to do the best procedure you can. In terms of the debridement, the console is very easy to use. It comes with three settings, low, medium, and high. Medium is usually sufficient in all cases. Very rarely, if you have a lot of ossific changes or calcific changes in the Achilles tendon, will you need to switch to high for a small period of time. Small strokes is definitely the way to go. Uh, we don't want to use large, broad strokes. That's when you get into trouble. Uh, just pretend you're doing an ankle scope. From the approach standpoint, the plantar fascia can be approached medially or plantarly. However you choose to do it, just make sure you have direct visualization under your ultrasound. The Achilles can be done in a, def a, def a couple different ways as well. You can go longitudinally from a superior to inferior uh, direction or from a posterior to anterior direction. I feel this is easily, uh, technically easier to perform. There's not a lot of subcutaneous tissue within that area and you have direct feedback when you know when you're in that area. Debridement time is usually two to five minutes. Uh, this can vary. Most people will actually relate to a higher debridement time as they get more comfortable with the procedure. There is nothing to date, and Juggy can clarify this, about uh, the uh, success rates with, uh, correlating to cutting time. But this, is, this will be seen as uh, literature comes out in the future. And then, as I mentioned, everything you need comes in the dressing. Uh, usually, the, a Band-Aid and Tegaderm is all you need. There's so much saline that comes around sometimes that the stereo strips don't stick. So very quickly, uh, the summary today, I hope you've had a chance to learn a little bit about this amazing brand new technology. This is a 10x procedure that's indicated for chronic tendon issues, and it's not for acute pain. It's an extremely safe procedure. I have 15,000 listed, but I think it's closer to 25,000, and we have maybe six complications. So knocking on wood, it's a very, very safe procedure. As I mentioned, there's very little downtime. Your patients will get back to work fast. From a physician standpoint, this is a new technology that separates you from your competition, and it's a new way to treat an old problem. I just had a patient come in from Longview, Texas, which is about three hours away. When I looked at the 10X website to find a physician for her, there's nobody within 100 miles that knew about this technology. So I'm very privileged to be one of those physicians. You have a high patient satisfaction for everything that we just mentioned. And when you look at the time to work ratio, everybody always wonders about reimbursement. The numbers that you'll be quoted are usually based on 20 minute time intervals. So if I've extrapolated that out to an hour, you're getting almost $1,000 per hour if you do three plantar fascial cases and almost $500 an hour for three Achilles cases. To my knowledge, I'm not aware of any other procedure that reimburses that high for such a short amount of work required. And then in the future, there might be some additional soft tissue applications in wound care or other soft tissue masses. So we certainly will look out for those. I thank you for your time, everyone, and uh, I appreciate you listening to this. Let's kick it off with some question and answers and have a discussion. Jay, let me begin by uh, thanking you. Exceptional presentation. It was very cogent, very thoughtful, and uh, as always, uh, well, well orchestrated and delivered. So thank you again. Um, can you hear me OK, Jay, Nathan? Yes, I'm well. clear. OK, perfect. Let me kind of put some questions to you that are kind of coming in, and then we'll, we'll open it up, open the mics up. Um, so in no particular order, Jay, um, when do you treat in your continuum of care in your continuum of care for both Achilles and plantar fascia? That's a great question. Uh, my first patient visit is usually an educational visit for the plantar fascia. I have braces and splints that I like to use, and I just try to tell the patients, "We'll try the easy thing first. Should you not have pain relief in the month of follow-up that I'll visit you, I'd like you to look at this brochure." 
in your downtime, this is something called 10x. I'd like you to read about it, see what you think, and then I tell them a little bit about my experience with it. So I will give these patients at least a month of conservative treatment, which is added on to the two to three months of pain that they've already had and treatment that they've had already. I certainly rarely have pulled the trigger right away. As I mentioned, there's a patient that came from East Texas that wanted 10X right away. She'd had pain for three years already. But in most cases, I always start with braces, start with the boot, start with the splint, NSAIDs, activity modifications, pain creams, and then I kind of tease them with the information so they can read it on their own. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, Jay, is it's difficult often to see a hypoechoic area in the plantar fascia. How do you decide if this patient should be treated? Uh, great question. There's a few different indications for this procedure. One is pinpoint pain right on that medial calcaneal tubercle, and that causes that patient to jump out of their ch chair. The second is if I, I have the, uh, the good fortune of having a high-quality ultrasound in my office, I will visualize that exact same point. So in le if I, for example, if I felt pain, if the patient felt pain when I pushed, but I didn't see that hypoechoic region, this wouldn't be a candidate for 10X for me. I have to have that positive verification, both clinically and visually on the ultrasound, so that I know they'll have a successful outcome postoperatively. Good, thank you. Um, do you ever prescribe physical therapy or nar narcotics post-treatment? Never, no, I, do, I really don't think it's necessary. Okay. Um, what's your average time to pain relief for both Achilles and plantar fascia? For the plantar fascia, it's a lot faster. I believe it's two to four weeks. I can get these guys to about 100%. For the Achilles, as I mentioned, I think the anatomy limits me. It's probably a little bit closer to four to six weeks. But I'll be honest with you, these are patients with a chronic Achilles tendinosis pain that are so miserable that they're happy to be 50 to 75% better. So I, I, I'm trying to find ways that we can modify either my technique or the timing of the intervention to get these patients closer to 100%. Great. The, the company reports 90% pain relief and their publications have a small number of patients. What's been your experience with a device? My personal experience uh, is it completely mirrors what the company refers to and, uh, as you mentioned, what the literature says. Yeah, and it sounds like it's uh, redundant and the reps mention this all the time when they come in, but I'm here to say it is true. It's absolutely true. I mean, if you perform the procedure on the correct patient in the correct way, you will get the results that are being reported to you. Jay, another question. What are the complications you see and how do you take care of them? The only transient complication I've noticed so far, and I'm, again, I'm knocking on wood, is a little bit of edema to the site of the, the debridement. Uh, I don't, this is something that just resolves over time. Otherwise, I haven't had the, the uh, any complications of you know, soft tissue infection. I haven't had any patient complaining of nerve pain-related symptoms, no lateral column pain. Um, my biggest complication is the failure, which I define as the reoccurrence of preoperative system, uh, symptoms, which has occurred in two patients. Great, thank you. What did, you, what did you used to use instead of 10X um, before 10X came along? It's a great question. Um, prior to conservative treatment, the, the only other option I had available for patients was surgical intervention, which in my hands, uh, I mentioned both before, but I was always comfortable and, and had good success with an instep fasciotomy. Um, this has been well described in literature with success rates, but even though it takes you know, a relatively short amount of time to do the, the case, the patient has to be non weight bearing for three weeks because of the plantar incision and stitches. Very rarely in the literature has there been complications associated with this. There is an incidence of lateral column pain, so by treating problem A, you're creating problem B. What I tell patients now is this 10X does not take the place of any of these previous treatment options. It instead is a third option. And I wouldn't hesitate to repeat the procedure if necessary because the downtime is so minimal, it's much better than doing the open procedure, especially with the Achilles tendon. Great. Another question for you, Jay. Uh, you talked about staying away from patients who've tried everything else. Can you explain what you mean by that? 
this patient has to be the chronic pain patient. Uh, we have a chronic pain management specialist in our office, and they, you know it's one of those patients where you look at them and they jump out of their chair in pain. So there's, I say that with a grain of salt. There's, there's certainly people, I just had a patient today actually, uh, a young lady who gave birth to uh, four children at the same time. She was uh, in a significant amount of pain. She tried uh, high energy ultrasound twice. She tried plantar fascial uh, inserts, night splints, cortisone injections. She legitimately, despite her high level of pain, needed help. When I refer to the chronic pain patient, I think that's more of just a seeker type patient who is not going who I know is not going to get better and who I know is just going to be a, a terrible outcome um, for later on. Great. Do you worry about the Achilles tendon rupturing? I'm not I'm never worried about the Achilles tendon rupturing uh, based on the procedure I perform. However, the lack of pain can give patients a false sense of security and this is why we caution them to refrain from high levels of activity until that 6 week mark. Awesome. Well, I think those are the questions that we have uh, that have been uh, uh, thrown over the transom here. Um, Nathan, what I'd like to do is, uh, and I know everyone's going to be unmuted here a little bit, so we're going to capture a little background noise. I want to open up the mics and see if there's any questions specifically for Dr. Sandu. So Nathan, if you could help us do that. I'll so it'll take a little while right as you go as one by one by um, opening up the mic. So. Uh, so Nathan, just let me know when all, when all the mics are opened up, and then uh, we'll let people put some questions to Dr. Sandu. There it is. And I know I know Jay is a pretty easygoing guy, so I think you can take questions about how many licks at the bottom of pussy roll. I don't think that'll affect you. Oh, absolutely, Jerry. Okay. okay, everyone is unmuted. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. So I know it's a little choppy with the background noise, but does anyone have any questions for Dr. Sandu? Dr. Sandu, live. Yeah. I yes. know that you like to take the plantar fascia approach, and you've told me why, but tell everybody else why. Uh, I, thank you, Ron. The, the, the question is more of the approach of the plantar fascia, my preferred technique. Uh, my technique is more of a plantar approach. My reasoning in my head is, when I'm approaching the plantar fascia from the plantar standpoint, I have a greater area to land uh, in terms of targeting that pathological tissue. My, in, you know, in, in a fanning technique from medial to lateral, I feel I can really get down to that in a plantar fascia right on that medial tubercle as it inserts on the calcaneus. There is a successful way to do it from a medial to lateral standpoint, but in my mind, I feel like I can get a greater success approaching it from a plantar. Have you ever operated on someone that had had failed surgery? Not to date, no. Would you consider it? You know, in that case, depending on what the surgery was, most likely it would have been some type of fascial release. I would probably get an MRI prior because I, I really would want to see the, the diseased tissue and verify it before I started debriding anything. Most likely it would just be a... a a ball of scar tissue that's connected the two ends of resected fascia. So in my mind, that would be something I'd want to verify first on an MRI. On your border town patient, who was enormous, uh, I've, who apparently has done well, what would be your alternative to, to what the Tinex procedure was on that patient that the, the ex-policeman or policeman operated on? So the literature tells us with uh, greater than 50% involvement in debridement of the Achilles tendon, we actually have to do uh, some sort of tendon transfer to augment the weakened Achilles tendon. In his situation, I would have had to debride and remove greater than 50% of the tendon. In cases uh, like that, you would probably do a short or long flexor loose as long as tendon transfer. But uh, you know, even though it's a simple procedure to perform, whether you transfer the tendon or not, there's a lot of recovery and a lot of downtime for these folks. What do you think happens in the tissue that is removed, like in an Achilles tendon, if you remove the diseased tissue that's say 20, 30, 40 percent, they're no weaker because it's, it's not effective in, in strength. Do you think that heals and in time that tendon becomes stronger? 
That's a great question, sir. I, I think that there is a inflammatory response going on um, that, that recruits growth factors and allows for this healing to occur. There's been a number of literature, and uh, Juggy can probably clarify this as well, that histologically shows the, the, the voids that's created by removing that necrotic tissue and then the infiltration of healthy tissue that our body produces later on. But I don't believe it's weakened uh, long term. There is certainly that protection period for the up to six weeks that we refrain from allowing our patients to perform high activity levels. So I believe that's because we want to maximize the healing potential of the procedure. So for everyone's benefit, just to add to that, uh, Dr. Sandhu is referencing a paper that was published recently uh, independently of us by Dr. Caminini. Uh, Dr. Caminini is an orthopedic surgeon at the University of Kentucky. And in an animal model uh, of chronic tendinosis, he found that after treatment with the 10X instrument, you had a return to normal structure of the tendon as observed by ultrasound. He also found that there was a return to normal uh, composition of collagen uh, that resembled the baseline, that meaning a healthy tendon. And that uh, uh, occurred about uh, uh, 90 days after treatment. So it was smelled very, very similarly uh, uh, to you know, where, the, where you have a remodeling effect, if you will. Uh, after the removal of the necrotic tissue. Is there a contraindication for bilaterals? I had another patient today, Ron, that's going to get bilateral surgery. Uh, I kind of talked, I talked her out of it, but I guess, you know, from a mentally invasive standpoint, as long as they're, if they're I never bench them. I always want to give them one good foot to walk out on. But this, this is a patient that said I'd rather just uh, get both of them done at the same time. I think if there's a support system at home, the patient can tolerate having limited weight bearing on, on both feet. It, it's really up to them. Uh, as far as an absolute contraindication, I think in, uh, with the Achilles, I would never do both at the same time. I will let you know how the bilateral plantar fascia patient is. Yes. Sounds like you guys go big with everything in Texas, don't you, James? You don't know. We have to. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Sandu? Okay, Nathan, can you um, mute everybody if that's possible? Yeah. All right, thank you. So as Nathan's doing that, let me let me close by first thanking everybody for joining in. Uh, I know it was late in the evening, so I appreciate all the attention and time. And finally, uh, Jay, extraordinary presentation. Very thoughtful again. Well done. Uh, I thank you for your time. And uh, you saw in the beginning, uh, if anyone needs to follow up with Dr. Sandu directly, please reach out to your 10X rep uh, or reach out to myself, and I'm happy to make that introduction. So with that, I'll close again by thanking everyone and specifically thanking uh, Jay yourself for your time. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed this webinar. Please, anytime, feel free to contact me with any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Good night.